So hi from my side as well. And uh, yeah, I'm also very happy to be here. This is actually the first time uh, when I'm in your city, the very first time for me. And also the first time at um, the Java user group, obviously. So I'm, um, yeah, my name is Sebastian. I'm from Munich, Germany, and I'm very um, happy to join Andres, Ixchel, and Kirk on the so-called Road to Basel 1. This is the seventh um, stop, I, I think, on our tour. So yeah, we, we, we're seeing a lot of, of central, central Europe so far. And yeah, now this talk is going to be about the buzzword CQRS and when uh, to apply it, why and how and so on and so forth. So who of you has heard of the principle? CQRS of this buzzword, okay? And who of you has applied it? Maybe even just like tested it out, okay, a little bit. Okay, great. So beca because it's going to be a lot about the motivations and, um, well, the principles behind that and also when and how to apply it, right? So my name is Sebastian Deschner. I'm uh, from Germany, from Munich, where right now the Oktoberfest is happening, which I'm very happy that I will miss it. And yeah, I'm a Java consultant, uh, trainer, uh, self-employed. And yeah, doing a lot of Java things, doing a lot of conferences and conference um, talks and in general, a lot of Java involved. So I'm help specifying the, uh, the future of Java EE and the um, JCP in two expert groups or whatever will be there um, in the future when um, Java EE moves, but that's a different topic. And yeah, also I'm happy to be a so-called Java champion and well, so on and so forth. So now about the um, principle or buzzword of CQRS. And first of all, the question when to apply this or why, right? And the motivation is well kind of connected with the shortcomings of traditional ways how we build enterprise applications, right? In a normally CRUD-based way. Create, read, update, delete, right? This is kind of typical how we build enterprise applications. We have a relational database. Um, typically, and we do so-called asset transactions to store the current state in our system, right? Because this is what we have. We have the current um, state in our application um, stored as such with all the domain entities and all the properties, right? And once we do something in the system, once we invoke some use cases, then we typically have a new state. And the old state, first of all, is forgotten, right? And this is also the first shortcoming of that. We don't have any context or history information as is, right? We can't repu repu reproduce how the application got in its current state, right? We, we don't have the, in, um, um, the history information simply. And then also, because we have this current state, we have to take the fact into it, the account that we are in an enterprise um, environment and that we potentially have multiple threads um, modifying the current state at the same time, concurrently, right? And we have to take this into account and deal with these competing transactions and basically introduce, well, introduce synchronization. And this is also the point um, why this approach, well, ultimately don't scale infinitely, right? Because of the so-called CAP theorem, consistency, availability, partition tolerance, you are either building a system that is consistent at all time or one that is fully ab um, able to scale, right? And that's just uh, what it is. So when it all, all boils down to a single, um, a single um, database, right? Relational database or something, that is the point where you have to synchronize and you n uh, won't be able to scale. So now about two motivations that ultimately lead to this CQRS principle which are somewhat related, but uh, not necessarily um, require each other. First of all, event sourcing, and second, event-driven architectures. So let's start with event sourcing. Who of you has built an event sourced system? Really, nobody? Because that is the interesting point, I will uh, uh, explain this later on. Event source system do, uh, per se have nothing to do with CQRS. You can build an event source system as is. So wha wha what is that? An event source system doesn't 
necessarily have the current state persisted as such, rather than it builds the current state and calculates that out of atomic events that are the core of your system. Prime example for that is money, banking, uh, tra banking accounts with money transactions, right? You have your bank account, which has a current balance of your account, and that balance is calculated from all the transactions in your system, right? Plus 100 euros, minus 50, and so on and so forth. And if you want to have your current balance, you start from zero, you apply all the transactions, plus, minus, and then you basically end up with that amount, right? And that is the prime example for um, an event source systems. And these events are atomic, and they are immutable. So they are a fact. They happened in the past, and um, they are the core of that system. And that comes with quite a few benefits, because then naturally we now have the full context and history information. So basically everything that happens to your system is stored as such with the core of the information. And then you can, well, use this for all kind of debugging or um, statistics information. So you can look at the system and see everything that happened. And if you want to reproduce how it got in its current state, well, you just look at all the events, right, and calculate them further on. And that comes with other things like testing. You can use all these events for system tests because they're a perfect match for this because that they are what happened to your production system, right? So you could just go and ta uh, take these events and reapply them in, in a test scope, which is quite nice. And you're also safe for what I would call future use cases. For example, if your project man manager comes to you two years after your system has been running in production, and asks you, well, how many users did sign up on today's Tuesday, on a Tuesday? And then, fair enough, you as a developer could say, I don't know, there was never a requirement, we don't have this information, right? Well, in an event source system, you do have this information because you're storing everything that happened to your system in an atomic way, and then you just take all the user signed up events, take the timestamp and calculate them further on and use this for this functionality. And then you can basically introduce that functionality and use it as if it has been there since day one because you have all this information already in your system, which is very nice if you want to have um, these future use cases. Any questions so far? I forgot to mention this can be interactive, this session, so if you have any questions anytime, then just feel free to interrupt me and ask. All right, then for the second um, motivation, let me um, explain a little bit. Event-driven architectures. So what does that mean? Um, that basically tackles the, the issue of scalability and boils down to eventual consistency and the fact that we are building a system which is not consistent. And in order to do so, let me tell you a story about the real world and how real world use cases are not necessarily consistent. For example, if you go to a restaurant, right, and you want to order a burger or a pizza, and you want to order that in a consistent way, so what does that mean, right? You go to the restaurant, you tell the waiter, I want to have a burger, please, right? And then the waiter nods and accepts your order. Now you would assume that this is a consistent transaction, right? But actually it's not, because a lot of things can go wrong before you get your burger, right? And this doesn't mean that you get your burger just because the waiter accepted it, because now the waiter will go to the kitchen and ask the chef one burger, please. And then the chef will say, scusa, sorry, <laughs> no burger left, we don't have ingredients, it's not possible. And then even though the waiter accepted your order, they will come back to you and say, sorry, sir, there is no burger left, right? So it was not consistent, your use case, you didn't get your burger. And then in the real world, what happens? Well, either exception, you're angry, angrily run out of the restaurant, right? Or the waiter says, well, it's such a nice day, don't you want to have some pasta instead? And whether this is a good substitute or not, well, this is the example how the real world deals with that. You have to deal with all these issues eventually, right? Because they happen. And this is what it's all about. We have to collaborate. We have to communicate with each other. Because it's just not consistent. What would a consistent restaurant mean? 
if you want to build this in a consistent way, then you order the burger, then the waiter shouts, nobody moves, stop, goes to the kitchen, you have to wait, goes to the kitchen, orders the burger, everybody has to wait, the chef, order, um, the chef um, prepares the burger, then the, client, uh, the waiter comes back to you and says, yes, I can make a burger, here is it. And then everybody else can continue. And of course, this wasn't scale, right? And you would have to act, uh, actively wait. So we have to have this eventual consistency, basically. And while well, by doing so, we have to collaborate, we are also trusting on somewhat outdated information, right? Because the waiter then has in its internal cache whether you have burger or not, and this can be outdated because once the burger ingredients are updated by the delivery truck, then, you know, it's outdated information, and we have to deal with these issues. And the thing is that the business has to be aware of that, because then it's a business question. How do we deal with that? And how can we build up compensating use cases, right? If something goes wrong, how do we deal with this issue? issue? Because it will happen eventually. So I would put it in the real world is all about collaboration. We have to collaborate with each other. Hopefully good intentions, because that's what it is. If you want to order a burger, that's first of all an intention to do so, right? And then eventually dealing with these issues, because they will happen, right? And this is also the idea behind event-driven architectures. So this means, first of all, you have to have several systems involved, like the waiter and the client and the chef and so on and so forth. If you don't have several systems, then it doesn't make sense because then you would just do it in one system and you can be consistent if you like, right? So you have to have several systems and they communicate asynchronously by events. And the events are, that's quite important, published reliably. So you still have transactions, but these uh, transactions are basically split up into smaller ones. So if you, as a client, order the burger, and you say, I'd like to have a burger, please, and you wait until the waiter reacts, basically, and accepts your order. So you wait um, for that confirmation, otherwise you can't be sure that the order is in the system, right? That's important. Then you can carry on and go to the toilet and being asynchronous, but um, th that's quite important. And by doing so, you split up this big transaction into ordering a burger into smaller ones. And now you are able to scale horizontally, right? You can scale up these systems because they are um, not, well, uh, they don't communicate in a synchronous way. So what does this mean? Let's play this example through not in a restaurant, but in a coffee shop, right? So let's say we are in a coffee shop, restaurant, and now you want to order a cup of coffee. And let's say we have several systems involved, so like an order system that does the order. And now if you want to have some coffee speciality, let's say we have some bean store, some bean store system that needs to be asked whether the ordered coffee is possible, right? And then eventually we have a barista who does something. And now on the top left, we have the order coffee, well, client invocation of the use case. We want to order a coffee. So that means we ordered at the order system, right? That's what happens. And now we could say the order system has to ask the bean store whether this is possible and synchronously wait and then goes back. But then this leads to distributed transactions, right? Which is a bad idea and this won't scale. So what we do instead, event-driven architectures, we find e an event. Order coffee will result in an event order placed. This event will be published reliably, and then the client can come back, do something else. So um, now the order is in the system. It doesn't mean that it's possible or accepted or something. It's just, first of all, placed in the system. That event is a fact, so it's there. And now, asynchronously, the beans store will um, consume that event and then invoke some functionality like validate the beans, validate the order whether it's possible. And now what happens? Well, and another event will arrive and will emit um, based on that. For example, order beans validated, which means yes, it was valid, that order has been validated. Or if it's not possible, another event. For example, order failed due to insufficient beans. 
And now the order system will now consume this e event again asynchronously and then update the status of the order to, for example, order accepted. That's a new event that then arri um, arises. So now if the client com comes back and wants to know about the status of the order, it will ask the order system and say, what's the status? Oh, order accepted. And now you see this is, um, this is done asynchronously and now you introduced eventual consistency because there will be some point where you ask the order system and the event has not been consumed, right? So it's basically reading an old state, but that's the nature of being eventually consistent. But now you get the idea how this ping pong um, effect works with the events. Now, finally, the barista system will um, go because it's only interested in accepted orders and it will start the coffee brewing process and then another event arrives, coffee brew started, which we can again consume to update the order, fetch some beans and so on and so forth. And then eventually the uh, coffee brew will be finished and delivered and we can update our order status, right? So um, any questions on that? So f uh, yes. Yes. Um, the question was, is that uh, related to domain-driven design? Um, yes, it is. So um, it's not necessarily... Right. You would deal with bounded context. So this is basically what it is. Um, the order beans and barista system, these are separate uh, applications and you would call it, well, the bounded context, everything that belongs uh, to that system, to that specific application, everything that's in responsibility of that application, for example, these domain events. So this is what it is, and that's the relationship. You would model domain events here um, of all the things that are listed there. Yes, very good question. Other questions so far for the principle? All right. Then let's go further and combine the, these two motivations of, well, event-driven architectures and event sourcing into the buzzword CQRS, the principle command, um, command query responsibility segregation. Very com complex and complicated name, right? What does it mean? It basically means we are separating the, um, the responsibilities for reads and writes, right? For so-called commands and queries. And again, we are based on event sourcing and event-driven architectures. So what does this mean? Well, we have several systems that communicate via these events, and these events are the core of our system. And we have commands that basically do everything that changes something, that changes state in our application. So they produce the events, right? Something gets called, like place order, and they emit events. And the thing is, it's like if you would imagine in Java, it's like a method, a signature, void, do something, right? That's a command. It doesn't return data, it only changes something, separating writes and reads. So once you invoke that method, you can be sure that it happens successfully and it potentially will emit events, right? Or nothing happens. Or it throws an exception, then of course it didn't, um, it didn't succeed. Or you have a getter, right? String get something which does not mutate the, uh, the state. So queries or read sites are not allowed to throw events, obviously. They would change something in the system. They only return data. And again, these events have to be handled reliably. So how does this work in architecture? I've drawn some ASCII art pictures here. We have a command service and a query service or several instances of these, which you can see, and they only communicate via this event hub or event store. So they only communicate via publishing and consuming events. And they're not connected in any other way whatsoever. And now we, well, you see, introducing um, even eventual um, consistency, and we're loosely coupling these systems. So you can be able to scale all these systems, right? They only, um, well, are, in, uh, are dependent on the events fired there. So, oh yeah, all of the instances have their internal representations, which I wrote as databases. We'll explain in a second uh, why we need that. 
these um, internal representations store the current state of your system, your current coffee order, for example. So in order to see what this means, let uh, me quickly go through such an example of ordering a coffee, of placing the order. So if you want to place an order from a client, we of course go to the command service side because we want to change something in the system, right? It's like void place order, like the Java method. And the command service can use the database for, well, basic validation and ultimately will fire an event or the placed using the event hub or event store. That is done synchronously. The client needs to know whether this was published reliably, right? And then it can return later on. Now this means this event, that's a fact, that's in the system. The order has been placed. Asynchronously, the command service and the query service will consume that event and use it to update their internal representations of the database or in-memory storage or NoSQL database or whatever they use. So they use all these um, events that happen to the system to update their status that they can use further on. For example, if the client comes back and wants to know about the current status of the coffee order, so the client will come to the query service and ask for this state, right? And now the internal representation is used that just has been updated from that event to return the current state. Any questions on that? Yes. 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 Totally correct. And this is important. So the question was about the databases, whether they are um, coupled, and the databases are totally independent. They are totally independent instances of databases. And as we will see later on, they can even be totally differently implemented. So you can use different kind of stores based on what you need on either the query or the command service side. So all the instances, no matter how many you have and no matter how they are balanced, are totally independent. They are only coupled via these events that are fired. And how they, cons uh, how they update their internal representation as seen here, it's totally up to them. That's totally independent. The, the timing. Mm -hmm. Yes, o of the event. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the question about uh, was about the timeline of of these events. So what happens once you fire this event initially? This has to happen in a reliable way. So this will be produced transactionally. The the client will write this to the event store, which or the event hub, which itself can be distributed. So for example, Apache Kafka, which I will use later on, it's distributed, and it needs to be sure that it's stored in the event store. Nowhere else but necessarily, but stored in the event store persistently. Then the client will return and do something else. And then asynchronously, so that's um, uh, totally independent, the event store will update all the consumers. And all the consumers, independently, will read this event and will consume it also reliably. That's what ca Kafka, which I will use, for, for example, um, make sure that once you consume an event, this has to be hap um, has to happen reliably. If it wasn't consumed, it will be redistributed later on. And it will done so in exactly once semantics. This is very important, so you will end up with the correct result. But this happens totally asynchronously from the beginning, from the publishing of the event. And therefore, we are able to scale. So very good question. And this also comes into play on the next thing, because now, eventually we want to have our coffee, right? So we have to have one process that listens to events and then triggers subsequent commands at the command service, obviously, further on. So we will listen to these events, and this is also 
handled reliably exactly once and now exactly once over all instances so only one instance will consume these events otherwise we will end up with several coffee orders right this will be bad and this is important and then one new command will be triggered further on that itself can also uh, result in new events and so on and so forth and this is how this works and this is how then the process will be um, well proceeded all right so now this means we are first of all able to scale all the well read and write sites and we can also scale both the read and write sites independently that means we can have more read sites instances if we like than write sites why will we need that well if you think of a typical enterprise application then normally the number of reads highly outperform the number of writes right you're far more often reading something http f5 http get right rather than you changing something in the in the system so that means you can fire up much more read instances that all of them consume the events store something in a database in an internal cache whatever they use and then just deliver traffic with well, high amount of data and just having few right instances based on your problem which is quite quite good you can't do this in a crud based way right mm. as i said you can also optimize each site independently for example if you want for for your read site you would need some no sql database or for your read site you can uh, introduce some further caching if you like which you don't need on your write site and so on and so forth that's based on the fact that all the instances are totally independent they can use their persistent or their representation however they like and this representation is also quite important because it um, solves the fact that in event sourcing you're calculating a lot of state right for example let's go back to event sourcing if you calculate your current bank account balance based on, uh, based on all the transactions right each and every time that would mean the system gets slower and slower and slower right you're calculating 100 transactions next time 200 1 million 2 million would not scale right over time rather than the CQRS approach what it does well it keeps the current state the current representation in this optimization in a cache or a database and just once a new event arises will be used to calculate the diff basically to ca calculate the new current state that will be persistent and you don't have to recalculate everything from scratch every time right you can if you like but you don't you won't do so every single time which is of course quite a benefit so it goes around that problem what else is quite interesting is that by introducing CQRS you get a read side failover capability why is that so if your event hub or event store goes down becomes unavailable this will be the same thing like in a crud based world your database becomes unavailable well then you can't do anything right you can't write you can't read while in a CQRS world you can still read because you have all the read instances with all the databases or caches available they won't get updated because the event hub is not there and it, it won't fire new events and you can't not write something because it cannot publish new events reliably you will end up in an error but still you can read right which is a which is a benefit um, as opposed to a crud based world any questions yes no that's good uh, the more you ask the more i can tell you that's great yeah okay so um very good question yeah what happens with out of order events that's based on the fact that the events have to be handled reliably what does that mean they have to be handled in order that's very important because otherwise if you for example calculate the number of beans based on the coffee orders which one is first and then it will be subtracted or not that's important to be kept in order and that is well based on the principle that they have to be handled reliably 
which means that one, if you use Kafka, so-called consumer group will um, handle these events at a time, or more precisely, exactly one a consumer group will handle these events over time. They can do so in chunks, but these chunks have to be in order. That's very important. Otherwise, uh, you will get into troubles in, in terms of your business. Very good question. Um, other questions so far? Otherwise, I will... Yes? Yes. Um, it depends. So the question was, uh, because we have different type of events, whether we need different queues or topics, how it's called there, um, for different um, well, type of groups or systems. It depends. You could actually model all of them in one single um, group um, or topic, one single queue. Then you just have to well filter out and basically just consume what you're interested in. Um, so it, it doesn't really make sense if you, for example, I have these three systems in the coffee shop, if you're only interested in one single topic at a time. So I will show this um, in a second at the demo. I, w I basically have three topics for this reason, but just to group it further on. Technically, if you like, you would have you could also have a single topic or a single queue, but that just would introduce more overhead because all of the other tenants get events they are basically not interested in. But yeah, you could what well, what you normally would do is that you uh, would model topics which make sense, so which uh, are for a specific domain or a specific bounded uh, context. In this case, a good question. Um, then you're free to continue to ask questions, but then I will um, continue to how to implement CQRS. In my case, with Java EE and Apache Kafka. So what I'm doing, I have an open source project. Um, which I will show, well, that's very small, um, which is called Scalable Coffee Shop. And it, well, has the same three um, systems that you already saw, right? An order system, bean system, and a barista system. And, well, they are used to process coffee orders in a scalable and asynchronous way, right? Using event-driven architectures. And I will have an Apache Kafka cluster running that is used to consume and persistently store all these events that happen. So I would love to live code everything for you, and this is normally what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, but you will see, and I will um, talk about this uh, later on, you will see that CQRS and all these event-driven things introduce quite some overhead. So it won't be possible to well, uh, code here everything from scratch in 50 minutes you will see if you compare it to a CRUD based way with, for example, JPA, it's much more overhead to, to implement this. Um, nevertheless, let me quickly uh, walk through some, um, some case similarly to what we did in, um, in the slides. And well, you're free to ask questions. So what I did here, I have uh, three instances. I have three systems that are three projects, will which will be built into three Java E applications, deployed on three application servers, built into three Docker containers, and so on and so forth. Why three? Why not six? I'm splitting the um, responsibilities for reads and writes here internally in the application for reasons of simplicity. Simplicity. This is only for well, code reasons, so they are not tangled in any way. You could totally split them up into independent systems. So as you will see, actually um, here in the JAXRS resource, this is my system boundary using HTTP implemented by J um, JAXRS. You will see that I actually have a command service and a query service, and they're totally separated. They only communicate via this way through the event store, right? So what happens, as you saw, we want to order a coffee. This basically means we are posting something um, to HTTP. JSON in my case, and what w uh, will it do? It will use the command service to well place a new order, right? 
That's what it's doing here. It uses the command service to place an order. That basically means it publishes a new event, order placed, what we saw, right? It publishes that using Apache Kafka, and that's it. It will later on return. This has to happen in a reliable way, which means we use a transactional producer. That is a feature that is available in Kafka since version 0 0.11, um, which I use here, which is quite important. So we make sure that this is there in a transactional way. right? And afterwards, the client returns and tells HTTP to, to accept it. Yes, thank you. I got your order. Come back later. I can't tell anything about it. I will tell you where you find it using, in my case, a randomly generated UUID and then the client can come back later. Now we know that the order is in the system. That's important. And now we can ask the system, now the query site, to give us the status, the current state of that order. So HTTP get on that um, URL, get order, give me the current status, which uses the query service to return that status, which if you think um, again at the, uh, of the diagram, uses the internal representation of the application to return the state, right? Which I use the um, coffee orders bean for. That is the internal representation, which in my case is the most simple way in memory using a hash map, right? A concurrent hash map that stores the current state of the coffee, coffee orders. How do I integrate these events that arise from Kafka? As you see here, Java EE already comes with a quite, um, well, quite effective eventing mechanism, namely CDI events. So I basically use CDI events to, well, um, to model all these events internally in the application. So what happens every time a new Kafka me uh, message comes in at that topic, I fire a CDI event, which will be used internally here. So by doing so, I can encapsulate all the Kafka stuff quite nicely. So my um, application is only well, dependent on my DDD domain events, which are uh, fired using plain Java E CDI events. So for example, the order placed event gets um, consumed here via the add observes annotated uh, event handler, and they update the, store, um, the status in my hash map which I can later on use to, well, return the current state for that UUID, right? And that's basically it. And then I will have some event handler mechani mechanism that does the same thing, um, also firing and observing CDI events that will then use the command service to well, trigger subsequent events, right? right? This is the event handler stuff that then calls commands like cancel order, accept order, and so on and so forth. That's what happens on, on the order side. Any questions so far? Otherwise, I will just uh, run it for now. So we have three systems. That means I have three command line instances, which fire up my three applications. So I have some build scripts that basically builds the application. And Andres before asked who is using Gradle, and I'm not. I'm using Maven. <laughs> just to annoy him. Actually, he submitted a pull request on my GitHub repository, which I didn't accept yet. I will, but I'm bad at uh, accepting GitHub uh, pull requests. So yeah, eventually that will use Gradle. Besides that, it well, builds the application and it fires up a Docker, it builds a Docker container as well, and it fires up a Docker um, container containing all these three applications that will then connect to my um, Apache Kafka cluster, which is also running locally. So a lot of doc Docker things involved here. And now I can, uh, um, I can use a new command line and, well, post a new coffee order, right? That's what we want to do. So we want to use that um, system boundary to place a new order. So, um, it's not quite big, but I hope you can uh, read that. Using curl to access the order system, which is exposed via port 8001 uh, for the Docker container. 
and it will post well a new JSON object to my orders um, resource. That means I will order a coffee, I will order an espresso with beans from Colombia, which then require the bean system to actually ask whether we have beans from Colombia and such a thing, and then the barista will need to brew that espresso, right? But anyway, let's just fire it. And then, as you saw, 202 accepted. Yes, thank you, come back later. And here is the URL if you want to ask the current state of that order. And we can access that URL, which will go to the query side of the order system, right? And it will tell us order cancelled. Why is that? It just has been accepted. Well, this is the asynchronous stuff going on. So first of all, it accepts the order. And then it will tell you it's not possible. Why? Well, because we modeled everything in memory, right? So the bean store is empty. It doesn't have the beans. And if you look at the output, you will see that basically there is an event order placed and there will be an, you can't read this, an order failed beans not available event. This was immediately published via um, the bean system that consumed your first event, then says it's not possible, and then the order says, well, too bad, I have to cancel the order. Now, we need some more beans, right? So let's add some. Let's post something to the bean system, port 8002, with beans from Colombia, amount 10. So let's add 10 portions of, of beans there, fire and HTTP 204, no content. Fine, it has been accepted as well. So let's see and look into the bean system there ask all the bean contents and it says, well, great, 10 beans from Colombia. Awesome, so we can see whether now it's possible to post the new order. The old one was canceled, so that's gone, unfortunately, but we can see, well, post a new order, please. Again, 202 accepted. Same story as before, it's accepted initially. And we can now ask for the status here using curl and access that state, right? And it will tell us, oh great, status started. So it already has been started. And if you look at the log, um, whether you can read it, I will tell you. It says, order accepted, great. And then immediately, that was the workflow, the barista system says, coffee brew started. And then eventually, that's internally using a timer, it will say, oh, status finished, and afterwards, status delivered. So the coffee is there, and that was successful. That's great. So now we finished our use case, which is done asynchronously by firing these events. Now, a few interesting things that we can do with these event sourced and event-driven architecture system. So now I stopped all these systems again, which is too bad because we have everything in memory, right? So if I fire them up again, what happens is I configured Apache Kafka in a way that once a new system comes up, because it doesn't have this persistence yet, I didn't implement it, it will ask for all the events that happened from day one, right? And all these events will be re-delivered to that new system. That means I can now go to a random new order system and ask for the status of that order, which is delivered. A Java object instance, which has been only um, persistent in memory, which was gone before, which was created using a randomly generated UUID, but it's still there using the same ID because the so a golden source of truth is my event store with all the events that are persistent there, right? And if I well, we apply all these events, then it has to come to the same outcome, right? Which is the case. I could fire up new instances that will connect to Kafka and redistribute all the events and so on and so forth, right? Of course, that's not production ready because what happens at application startup, it will ask for all the millions of events and it will start up slower and slower and slower, right? So what you have to do is you basically go to this point which is the internal representation of your POJOs, of your domain entities, and you will introduce persistence, right? For example, JPA. And then you will have 
a relational database or some kind of persistent data store you would like to use, which then is used to, well, persistently store your events, right? And then once a new event arrives from the event store, you will persistently store it there and then you don't ask for new events because then you can commit it and say, okay, I got it, thanks. If I start up n uh, newly, I don't have to have it again because it's there in my database. Also, what's quite Im uh, interesting, if you now would, for example, fix some bugs or introduce further functionality, that is quite interesting. For example, if I want to calculate now how long it usually takes to brew a coffee, I could introduce some functionality here, rewind everything, reapply all the events that happened in the past, and I can output these statistics as if my functionality has been there since day one, right? Because I reapply all the events, it will calculate the current state, the new statistic of whatever, how long the brewing process takes, and then I have that information and I can output it, which is quite interesting. Right? So this is what, what we can do with um, the CQRS approach that in this case goes back to event sourcing. Now, a little bit more about when to apply this approach. Um, because as I said before, we need distributed systems. We need several systems that communicate using this event-driven architecture approach. And that's important. If we don't have several systems involved, and if we don't do microservices, or however you want to call distributed systems, then don't do secure RS. And that's important. Because if we don't have um, this scenario, then it doesn't make sense. Because what you're uh, doing then, you're introducing a lot of overhead. What you saw in the code, you have to define all these events and so on and so forth. You have to, you have to set up an Apache Kafka, you have to connect uh, to it, you have to deal with this eventual consistency. If you can do so using a single monolithic application, then fine, that's good, go with that. And actually, relational databases and a consistent approach scales well enough for most of the enterprise applications go with that road first and only if for some reason be it scalability or team sizes or, um, or project life cycles you need several distributed systems then it makes sense to think about that approach having that said if you want to have the benefits of event sourcing you can still do so you can build event source systems using a consistent way right just use a relational database or something like that and store all the events in a consistent asset, good old way. Totally fine. You have the full history information. You have the full context. It won't scale as um, event-driven architectures do, but if you don't need to scale that way, totally fine for you. And it will be easier, right? And that's very important to mention. Other than this, CQRS is a very Im uh, interesting approach, as I think. So. Of course, this was only 50 minutes now, and it's a quite, well, complex, a uh, rather complex topic. So if you would like to uh, know more about that, I put all the uh, code that you saw uh, on GitHub, so-called scalable coffee shop under my repository as Dashner. And you will even see two pull requests from Andres back there, who did pull requests on, for example, introducing Gradle, which at some point I will accept. And if you also want to uh, learn a little bit more about the concept itself, I recorded a video course, which is available for free, under my blog, sebastiandashner.com. And it well explains again in a li little bit more time and a little bit more detail, especially how you connect to Kafka, how you do this topic. So go to my blog if you like, and you will see a lot of episodes that show myself showing this principle, right? Other than this, if you don't have any further questions, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>